if you're going to help people, you need to be a good listener. So I'm going to give you some tips on how to do that. Uh, now these, when I started doing pregnancy counselling, it was all on the phone, pretty much. Um, we had local numbers, we had an 0800 number, and people rang up and we spoke to them on the phone and you got a sore arm, you know, up to an hour of listening to people and writing notes with the other one. Now, of course, there's the whole plethora of ways of communicating. So we have somebody carries around with them a text phone. Uh, we have people who email us from our website. Uh, and probably more than any other avenue, we've got people messaging us on Facebook. We've been doing some Facebook and Instagram advertising, and people have responded to this hugely. And when they message us, we try to encourage them to phone us or meet with us face to face because it is an easier way to communicate. But many of them don't want to do that. They just want to message us. So we have to go with that. Um, but you as students, if you encounter somebody um, there's lots of different ways you can have a conversation with people. Um, texting, messaging, emailing, phoning, WhatsApp, Skyping, Zooming, whatever. Um, so think, how do you like, how do you feel comfortable, most feel comfortable uh, communicating with someone you don't know very well? What would you prefer? Anybody want to share? Yes. Just All oh, right. You'd actually prefer to see them. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Right. Would you keep all my readers and have any conversation? Yes. 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 And that's because I'm in a vulnerable position. Probably yep. messaging. Right. But if it was another, you know, superior party, that would be more natural. Right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. In, in case the camera missed that, um, someone was sharing that it's very age related how you like to communicate, and older people definitely prefer in person, and younger people may say, um, I want to talk to you, but they don't mean on the phone or in person, they mean have a chat over. In, through messaging or something. Okay. Let's move on. So sometimes you have a choice and sometimes you don't. Um, with our kind of counselling, we, we just have to run with whatever way we can. But think about what do you miss out on if you are just texting or messaging? What can you not communicate that you could if you were sitting down in the park with someone, sitting on the beach with someone, sitting in a cafe with someone. What, what would you miss out on just by emailing or messaging? Well, the body language. The, the body language, yes, yes. Emotions that are expressed in voices, faces, gestures. <laughs> Anything else? Pardon? Uh, I am guessing that I'm processed with like physically like consoling them as well. And right, them the and yes, yes, yes. Um, as as counsellors, we have to be fairly reserved and you know, you don't go rushing to hug people and um, make them cry on your shoulder. But yes, physical touch, um, even just a hand on the shoulder can be very consoling. Um, it's, it's much easier to do that. Uh, and, and just to say a word or two if you're on the phone or with them, say, that's, that's okay. You know, they're crying their eyes out. It's okay. You, you take your time. You just talk when, again when you're ready. Now, you can't do that over messaging, and you wonder why they've suddenly gone quiet. 
And for all I know, they might be bawling their eyes out, but I don't know what's happening. Why have they stopped messaging? <laughs> There's a big pause. <laughs> yeah. um, there are advantages, though, in, in just writing the messages. What are some advantages in that? More honest. It is more on yes. And that can sometimes allow people to be more honest than they would be if it's not open to yes. the person. Yes. Like if, they, if it kind of feels like you're talking to people together, then you can be more as honest with yourself, you can be more honest about what you're going through because you're not breaking right. the relationship because the person who met you yeah. can't see you. So if you're messaging you feel more anonymous, um, feel freer to be honest. Yes, there's a lot of that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, you can take time. And we have a lot of people for whom English is not their first language. So they say they don't feel comfortable phoning. They would struggle to express themselves in voice. Um, but they can scribble something down, even check it with Google Translate or something. I had a Syrian person contacting us recently um, and it was all in Arabic <laughs> so I was having to <laughs> cut and paste it across into Google Translate what is this person saying and and it was a guy saying my wife is pregnant and she she no clothes can you send clothes and I said well if you are in New Zealand um, we can probably help you but if you're not in New Zealand I'm sorry we can't um, so yeah, so some people prefer messaging where they can think about what they're going to say. As a counsellor, you have plenty of time to answer and think, what are you going to say? Or, or if you're a friend of someone who's pregnant, you also can take time. Is that the best way to say Is that the best question? So, so that's good. You can write something, delete it. No, no, it's a better way of saying it. Whereas if you're in person, you say it and it's, it's out, it's done. So, yeah, there's some advantages in, in messaging. But it is nice to be with someone in person, be able to see them. Um, these are the things you can do. Hear the emotions in their voice, which may differ to what, from what they say. Now, I struck that recently. I was actually talking to another of our counsellors in another part of New Zealand, and she was upset about something. And she kept saying, it doesn't matter, it really doesn't matter. And I said, your voice is telling me your tone is telling me it does matter. <laughs> so even though her words said it didn't matter, I could tell she was really upset and angry. Um, yeah, you can allow them to cry. You can communicate your kindness, which somebody mentioned, or empathy with your own body language and your tone. Um, you can take pauses and you know they aren't hanging up on you. You can show them literature too um, or look together at a website if they need some information. So it is good to actually meet with somebody if you're trying to help them in a crisis. Um, but if it's not possible to meet up, well, you just have to yeah, run with it, and we've covered that. Now, I want us to talk about good listening and bad listening, or poor listening. How do you know when someone is not really listening to you? What are some of the signs? No. Yes, where they're looking. Um, although there are people who prefer listening just with their ears and not with their eyes. Um, I've got a friend like that. It took me quite a while to get used to her, her way of. If she was really concentrating on what I was saying, she would really look down. And it was odd because I'm a person who likes eye contact. Um, but generally, yeah, you can tell a person is distracted or bored when they're looking somewhere else. What else? Doing something. Yes, doing something else. <laughs> yeah. What else might show you that they're not not concentrating on you. P picture quite a, a hum, like at lunchtime, there are lots of people and people moving around. Um, if someone's not concentrating on you, what might happen? 
actually follow someone else's conversation or their um, or join join in someone's conversation. When you jump into a different of yes. 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 Complete change of subject or or they've 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 skipped what you've put in. They just haven't taken it in and they've moved on to something else. That's that's telltale. Any other ideas? So there's things like, yeah, they're doing something else. One of our counsellors, I had to have a talk to her because a client rang up and said, I rang up and I had, I was really upset and I really wanted someone to listen to me and, and I could hear her doing the dishes in the background. So I rang, spoke to this, we pinpointed who was on duty by the time of day and the day and I had to ring up and talk to this counsellor and she said, no, I was really concentrating on that person, but I was unloading the dishwasher at the same time. And I said, okay, from your point of view, you were listening, but what she was hearing over the phone was the clatter of the dishes, and she, did it. she was distracted by it, and she didn't feel listened to. So the important thing is that the other person feels listened to. So that's just something to be aware of when... When someone is really upset, they want your attention. Um, but poor listening, yes, asking you to repeat yourself a lot uh, because, oh, oh, what was that? You know, they, their mind has wandered somewhere else, their attention's wandered somewhere else and they're coming back to you. Um, or they ask questions that show that you've just told them that you're six weeks pregnant by, by what you've worked out and they're saying, oh, how, how far along do you think you are? How many weeks pregnant do you think you are? You know, and you've just given them the answer, so they haven't been listening. Um, or you're jumping in with their own thoughts and stories as soon as you stop speaking. So you want someone who takes in what you're saying and picks up on it. Maybe they need to move you on a bit, um, or maybe they need to just reflect back what you're saying. Um, but they do acknowledge what you've said. They connect things up and move on a little bit. Um, or changing the subject. Sometimes you talk about something and you can tell the person is quite uncomfortable. They really don't want to talk about this, and so they'll change the subject. Um, so if you're wanting to help someone, those are the, some of the things you don't want to be doing or that the person might think you're doing. Now, what would constitute good listening? We've talked about the poor listening. What about some good listening? How can you tell someone is really listening to you? Ideas? Yes, so they help you to put into words um, and they need to check with you that's one of the things you've learned in counselling. Um, don't assume you've heard them right or don't assume you've got their viewpoint right, but you can, you can test it out and say, so you're, you're angry um, not because of that, but because of that. And, and they can say, yeah, yeah. Or, or no, no, it's not quite like that and they can make you understand it better. So yeah, reflect back to them what you think they said. Anything else about good listening? Yeah, so I'll give you a few pointers. Um, it's helpful to ask open-ended questions and I'll go into that in another couple of um, minutes. The person will be focusing on you and your thoughts and your feelings. When you're helping someone who is pregnant and not overjoyed about it, it's both what they are thinking and also what they're feeling that matters. And um, you can't just listen to one and ignore the other. Occasionally you'll get a person who doesn't express their emotions at all um, and they're just very matter-of-fact about it and this is how it is. Um, they're actually quite difficult people to help. Um, I have found it easier to deal with people who are pouring out their emotions and they're obviously 
visibly upset, or, or you can hear the emotion in their voice, that they're really uh, devastated, uh, they're really angry with someone, or, or whatever it is, that is actually easier to cope with than the person who seems to have no emotions at all. And you're thinking, but you're unhappily pregnant, you're not accepting of the pregnancy, you're talking about abortion, yet there's no emotion. Um, so that's kind of like a red flag. <laughs> Where have their emotions gone to? Um, and you may need to question them to, to find out and, and actually ask them questions about their feelings. Um, some people, they, they will, they're quite clever at kind of separating heart, head and heart. Um, but that doesn't lend itself to good decision making. If you simply try to make a very pragmatic, rational decision about whether to have a termination or not, or whether to adopt this baby out or not, or whether to do anything else, um, and you totally disregard your feelings, your gut feelings, your heart feelings, uh, I don't think you're going to make a really good decision because we are complex beings and we do have feelings that are important. The more important something is to you, the more emotion will be tied up with it. If you just totally suppress that and say, no, I just have to make a practical decision, it's not a good time to have a baby, I will have it at termination, um, later on that can all unravel and your feelings come back and you think, hmm, why did I totally ignore them? Um, I'll tell you a story uh, about a lady who um, I was called out to see. Her sponsor called me to see her. She was a refugee from an African country that was war-torn. And I thought, oh, she's probably a Muslim. This is going to be cro very much cross-cultural for me. I went out to see her in her home. She had two children. She'd been separated from her husband uh, during conflict, didn't know if he was alive or dead, um, waited quite a time. He still didn't come back to her village. She applied for refugee status in New Zealand and she came here and our government helped her out. She got a single parent benefit, um, sole parent benefit. Um, she was managing her money really well. Uh, she was gathering support. Then her husband came back across the border from the other country he'd moved across into to escape the war. He inquired about his wife, found she'd come to New Zealand. He applied for refugee uh, status as well. He came out. He was reunited with her. He took over managing the money and he totally mismanaged it. He drank and he misspent and thought, this is whoopee, I've got all this nice cash which I haven't had for a long time. And there wasn't enough money for food um, or for another set of clothes for the growing boys. And the wife was finding this very hard. Then she finds she's pregnant. So at that point she's thinking about having a termination. Um, she didn't know whether she was going to stay with her husband, uh, what was going to happen. So this, but she was upset about this decision, so the sponsor called us. So I went out there and I began to talk with her and got her story. And I said, um, your sponsor said you're thinking about having a termination. So what are your thoughts about that? And she said, well, I know it's wrong. And I said, what makes you say that it's wrong? And she said, well, I was brought up Catholic, and I, to me, it's destroying a child's life. I, I, I think of it as wrong, but I just don't know what else I can do. So I said, look, if that's how you think about it, that's, that's your moral stance, that it's something wrong, this is not a time to just put your beliefs away on the shelf and say, I've got to do this because it's the practical thing to do. Because in the future, you're going to come back to your beliefs and you're going to think, why did I do that? It's, it's not good to go against your own personal beliefs. And that was a huge turning point for her. Um, 
And she said, well, in that case, how am I going to cope with the pregnancy and, and resolving things about our marriage? And I said, well, you're going to need professional marriage counselling. I'm not a relationship counsellor. So that was arranged. Um, she and her husband went for counselling. Um, she did end up separating from him. She realised that they just couldn't agree on how to manage the money or the children or anything else. Um, so I ended up helping her right through the pregnancy and she went back on to um, you know, government benefit. But to me, the important thing was that she expressed her long-felt beliefs and values and I recognised that and backed her up and said, don't ignore those. But otherwise she could have done that sort of head-heart divide and said, no, I've got to be pragmatic, this is not going to work. <laughs> I've, I've got to just yeah, have a termination. Um, uh, good listening also allows for silence. Um, now that's hard to do if you're just on the phone, so <laughs> we find we have to sort of say, are you still there? Um, say, yes, okay, that's fine, just, just talk when you're ready to, especially if they are emotional, or they're having trouble putting their, their emotions into words, that can be difficult. So don't be afraid of a bit of silence when you're talking about something that's pretty emotionally charged. And the other thing about good listening a really important thing is don't minimise what they think is hard for them. Now, it might seem no great hurdle to you, but if you play down something they think is really difficult, um, they will not feel understood and, and valued. Um, just trying to think of an example. Um, for instance, after a person's had a miscarriage, um, people will say things like, oh, don't worry, dear, you're young, you'll get pregnant again, um, which doesn't recognise that they have lost a child and they're grieving about it. So don't play down what is important to the other person. Um, maybe you need to help them to, gently help them to have a bigger perspective. Um, they've, they've known this guy for six weeks, they're pregnant to him, it's never been a very good relationship and now he's walked out and she's really upset about it. You might think, well, actually, I did meet him once and I don't think he was good for her, but you, you have to start from where she is, that she is upset about him leaving um, and just encourage her through that um, to seeing that, you know, maybe she'll find another, another guy and... Um, or give, it, give herself time and she will adjust to him not being around, whatever. Now, open and closed... Oh, actually, I think we'll do an exercise. Um, I think we've sat long enough. Um, if you can get yourselves into pairs, um, and I want one of you to be the talker and one to be the listener. So can you just do that? If you need to scoot along the row so you've got a bit of space between you do that but um, yeah if you can connect up with one other person quickly um, and decide who's going to talk first and then we're going to swap over now first of all I, I want the talker to talk about how how you like to relax how you like to unwind after a stressful day what do you like to do um, maybe some music you listen to or whatever. Um, and I want the other person to be the bad listener. So you're allowed to yawn, fiddle with your phone, look around, whatever. Um, and the talker, try hard to keep talking until I give you a signal and I'll, I'll ring my little bell just to signal you. Okay, so start talking and bad listening. <laughs> Okay, st 
stop and I'd like you now to morph, you listeners, you bad listeners, um, I want you to morph into really good listeners and be very attentive. Okay, carry on. Okay, now I want you to swap over and the talker becomes the listener and the listener can do some talking and do the good listening again. So whoever has been, whoever has been talking about their way of unwinding, you now are the listener and the listener becomes the talker. Sorry to stop you, I know you're enjoying yourselves. <laughs> but tell me, how did it feel when you were not being listened to properly? How did it make you feel? <laughs> I mean, I know it was just a, a bit of a game, but did it feel good? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good comment. Someone said, you don't feel like continuing talking because you're not being properly listened to. Any other comments? For me, it's like talking is the process of learning, right? All oh, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, there's a personality difference. <laughs> Some people are happy to talk anyway. <laughs> it changes what you say as well, so you're a ah. to do All right. It changes what you say, yeah. And what did it feel like to be really listened to? Someone very attentive to you. How did that feel? Yeah. Yes, yes. That's good. You feel loved, you feel the interest in you as a person. So let's have a look. Um, the other aspect of listening is particularly if you don't know the person well. And I don't want to assume that it's going to be your very best friend who gets pregnant and you're going to be trying to help. What if it's a friend of a friend or uh, yeah, someone you don't know very well? You need to find out what's going on in their life and what their problems are. So you'll use a mixture of open and closed questions. A closed question is a kind of... A, Fill in the form question, like, you know, your name and um, what you're studying or something. Or are you studying full-time or part-time? But that doesn't really help you to know the person. Um, you might ask, they think they're pregnant and you're not sure, so you ask them, have you taken a pregnancy test? Or how far along in the pregnancy are you? Or have you told your boyfriend? And those, they could answer with just one word, yes or no, or six weeks or whatever. But it's like looking into a garden through a closed gate. You, you get a little glimpse, but you're not getting the full experience. Whereas if you ask open-ended questions that usually start with who, what, where, sometimes why, go lightly on the why questions. Because if you ask a lot of why questions, people feel like, hmm, I want to know they're questioning what I've done, you know, they're calling it all into question. Uh, and you don't want them to feel like that. But there, there is a place for why, like, um, 
why do you think it made you so angry? Um, that's, so you're inviting them to explain a bit more. You can ask things like, what is your situation right now? Um, who can you imagine giving you some support at this time? Sometimes people have someone in their family that could support them, but it's not their own parents. Maybe it's a grandparent they need to go and break the news to first. Maybe a grandparent is um, less likely to overreact and be more understanding and supportive. So get them to think outside the box. Um, who could support them? Um, how are you feeling about being pregnant? If they haven't already expressed that, that's really important. And, and a question that we use a great deal is, what is worrying you most at the moment? Um, that's a good place to start. Now, you might have to explore some other things, but what is worrying them the most? What's uppermost in their mind right now? If you start to address that and you ease that, you give them some ideas of how to cope with that, then they can move on to lesser things. But if you don't address that thing that's just replaying, replaying in their mind, um, parents are going to kick me out. Uh, yeah, uh, what else might they be worrying about? I'm... I I'm, yes. 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 Right. Okay. In case people didn't hear that, that was um, a woman whose biggest worry at that moment was paying for the five-year-old's new school uniform. Um, yeah, I have. I remember going out to see a couple, and they were thinking about having a termination. Married couple with t three children, and that all they could think of was, yeah, how are we going to fit a fourth child in the car? It only seats five. We can't afford a bigger car. We can't. And they were sort of picturing big people movers and things like that. And so. And, and the, the ongoing cost, the eventual cost of another child. Um, anyway, I went out to do a face-to-face -face with them. And on the way out, I'm praying and thinking, what can I say? And I'm traveling along behind a station wagon. And it's got a rear-facing car seat built into what you'd call the boot of the car. And I thought, well, there's one solution. <laughs> so when I got there, um, you know, I had a good discussion with them. And, and that was one thing. Oh, and the guy had, had he'd lost his job. That was the other thing, the big thing. Um, and so, yeah, anything financial was looking very uh, threatening because, because of him not having a job. Um, anyway, I, I kept in touch with them, and I even saw a, an ad for work in, in that guy's very field, and I shared that with him. I, I rang up to, to share that and as a possibility, and he said, oh, no, I've got another job, fine. And we're carrying on with the pregnancy. Um, so, so it's those things initially that they're focusing on that you may have to address. Um, yeah, and how did your boyfriend react when you told him we were pregnant? So you don't just want, you know, did they tell him, did you tell him he, you're pregnant? Is he happy about it? But try to ask those open-ended questions that get them talking more to describe things. Um, we've done that. Um, so here are some of the qualities of a good listener. And it might not be easy to read on your tiny little printouts. Um, a good listener should be caring, gracious, uh, Sometimes you have to exercise some self-control and being gracious when, yeah, you think what they're worried about seems petty um, or the way they've behaved seems very reckless um, or other things. I've, I've talked with prostitutes, for instance, and while I don't um, endorse their lifestyle, their way of making money, um, 
I have to treat them with respect and interest and caring, just like with anybody else. Um, you should be empowering, so you're not there to take over someone else's life, but to, to help them find the power to, to take the next step to get out of their crisis. Showing interest, being intelligent. Often you have to think outside the box. Um, I mean, in Auckland, the cost of living is so high um, that people's money is really stretched. And then if they think about you know, another child or, or someone who's a student and run up a big student debt, they're anxious to get into a full-time job, earn some money, pay off their, their debt, or, although they don't charge interest, do they, until you do start working. But still, it's, it's hanging over them. People um, want to clear those debts. So you have to think intelligently, um, possibly at a time when they are not able to think very methodically about their problems. You help them with their problem solving, and I'll talk about that in the, um, in the next workshop, the, the nitty gritty of helping people solve their problems, other agencies you can bring in. You need to be trustworthy, um, particularly if it's a person you don't know well. You need to build that trust. And little things like um, saying that you'll get in touch with them the next day or, or after they've been to see the doctor or, or been for their scan or whatever, keep your word and, and do that. Um, if you say that you're going to try to find out about um, some budgeting help for them and you, you'll get back to them by Thursday, come Thursday, you still haven't found a good budgeter in their area, but you, the important thing is be trustworthy, call them back, get in touch with them, text them or whatever, and say, look, um, I'm, still, I'm still working on it. How are you getting on? So show that you keep your word, because being trustworthy at a time of crisis is really important to the other person. So you may not have all the answers, you may not be able to achieve what you'd like to in a time frame, but just show you're trustworthy. Be sensitive, be open-minded um, to, to recognise other people's um, perspective and be caring. What else have we got? Um, so I think that's our last slide. Is that the last one? Yeah. So to truly help someone in crisis, um, yeah, you need those two things, and um, both encouraging them and also giving them information. Have we got time for a little activity? I think we have. Um, does any? Yeah, I'd like to do a very simple scenario: um, a small child of three or four locked himself in the bathroom. Um, he managed to reach up enough to slide the bolt and lock it, but c can't unlock it. Um, he's given up trying. He's sitting in the middle of the bathroom floor, bawling his eyes out, and someone, you can be the babysitter or you can be the parent. Um, so are there two people who would like to be brave enough to come out and act this out? Uh, we'll make a barrier perhaps with that chair there. Um, anybody like acting? So it's very simple, but it demonstrates something quite well. Um, I'll bring it over here. So, so somebody to be the babysitter and someone to be the little child who's upset. What part would you like to play? Um. Are you good at playing part of a child, or do you want to be the the good babysitter? I can play with it. What do you want to do? You right. Okay. So you're the so you're sitting on the floor if you if you can do it in a skirt, <laughs> yeah, and just wailing and crying, and and you're the the babysitter. Now you've got to talk through the the keyhole of the door or the gap in the door, and you've got to do two things. You've got to calm this child down. She she can be a girl. Singer. She's not a guy. Um, this little girl, she's so upset, 
she's not going to hear you if you don't calm her down enough. You're allowed to bribe her. You're allowed to say, um, what do we do when you come out? Would you like an ice block when, you, when we get you out of here? And so you've got to encourage her and calm her down. Then you've got to tell her there's a little stool in the corner of the bathroom and if she can just get that and push it over to here, she can climb up and she can slide the bolt, but then the stool will be in the way. So she's going to have to get off the stool, move the stool again, and then we can open the door. So I'll leave it to you. <laughs> What do you want to do when we get out? We get you out of there, all right? Okay, we'll take you to the park when you get out. Okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you can you see the stool in the corner? What I need you to do, I need you to get the stool and bring it close to the door. Okay? Can you do that? Okay, you're going to bring the stool over here and put it by the door. Now, can you can you hop up on the stool and see if you can reach the latch? Can you, can you reach the latch now? Okay, I need you to open the latch. Open the latch, slide it, slide it to the side. Yep, can you wriggle it? There you go. Now you hop off the stool. Hop off the stool and go move the stool away from, and then I can open the door. And I'll open the door and we're out. Let's go to the park. <laughs> Very good. Now that's your, your first practice of crisis counselling, <laughs> crisis intervention. So, yes, so there's those two elements of calming the person, making them feel listened to and valued, um, and the second one of practical steps. What can you, information can you give them? And, and in pr case of pregnancy, an unplanned pregnancy, there's, there's two kinds of information really. Um, there's information that addresses their need, such as the financial one. Um, is there someone who can help them financially? Can they get an accommodation supplement from the government? Um, can we get them a sponsor to help co cover medical costs if they're um, an immigrant and they're only on a student visa? Uh, so practical things like that, but also um, information about the unborn child. Now, some are quite ignorant of what's going on inside of them. I, I had a client um, once who came to me in the second pregnancy. I had never met her in the first pregnancy, and I didn't, I hadn't thought to ask, "Is this your first pregnancy?" So that was a vital question I missed. So I went along to see her. She was only 17, um, pregnant, and I thought, well, she's going to need some support. It turns out it was her second pregnancy, and I was showing her, I was talking to her about um, taking care of herself during pregnancy and, and how big her baby would be, and I, I gave her some pictures to look at. And she said, oh, wow, that's how big my baby would have been last time. I said, oh, what do you mean last time? <laughs> and she said, um, yeah, I, I had a termination and it would have been just at that stage. And I felt terrible that I hadn't, you know, asked that vital question of it, you know, whether it was her first pregnancy. And I just brought out all these um, pictures of unborn children and um, then realised we were dealing with a past abortion as well. But she had been totally ignorant of what was at stake. Um, she'd been only 16 at the time and her boyfriend's mum had organised the abortion for her and said, oh, you know, you're still at school, this is not the time. She didn't realise what, what was involved in abortion, anything like that. So, um, and I thought that is so sad that nobody during that first pregnancy actually explained to her what, who was at stake, whose life was at stake. Um, so, so some of the information you might want to give them, and, and that depends on what they're open to. And when I go to see a client, um, or when I talk to them on the phone and offer to send them literature, 
I would, or these days it'd be messaging mostly, so I can offer a website, perhaps a link. Um, but you can't force someone to take in information they don't want to. So, so I might say to them, um, particularly if it's a very young person, do you want to know what stage your baby would be at, what, what they'd be like? Um, I might drop into the conversation, you know, your, your baby's heart is beating already. One lady, she'd been to, to have her scan done and she said, oh, they told me it's just like a little bean. And I said, yes, it's about the size of a bean, but it's amazingly, um, what's the word? I can't think of it right now. Um, well formed, you know, there's different parts. Parts of that fetus are already becoming the heart and the liver and the lungs and other organs. Um, it's quite complex. So, so you, you need to be feeding information on the one hand and encouraging on the other. Just like in, in the bathroom scenario, it's no good just saying, oh, get the stool. Just put the stool up to the window, for goodness sake. Put, put it to the door and you'll get it open. The, the child won't listen when they're in crisis. And, and adults are the same. Um, I've had clients who've been through it, right through an abortion, and um, I say, were you not told this or this or this or when you were at their cl clinic? Um, and they said, oh, I don't know. They might have said something, but I was too upset to take in what I was being told. So... So you need to feed information to them gently and, and sensitively and appropriately. Um, and yeah, the two-hand approach uh, works well.